everyone. Um, thank you so much, Gayan, and everyone here for having me tonight. I'm a bit too excited to share. I just messaged Gayan earlier. I'm like, I think I've got way over 10 minutes to share. Um, so bear with me. I will try to go quickly um, and don't hesitate to get in touch with me afterwards if there's any burning questions and things that um, I don't address right now in the next 10, 15 minutes. Um, but yeah, so I am Kate Cormack and I'm the National President of Whisper Life, which is a huge honour. I'm also part of an outreach at Hastings Hospital, which is our local abortion facility, unfortunately. Um, so I'm part of a group that do sidewalk counsel and outreach to women who are considering abortion or most of the time we're actually speaking to women who've had an abortion. Um, so that's... that's um, a bit about who I am, but I'm just here to talk to you tonight about the Safe Areas Bill. Um, you might not have heard about it, um, and I don't quite have time to read over the bill itself um, because that would just take too long. So I'll focus on the flaws of the bill and why it's important that we oppose it. Um, I think Gayanne will share a link in the chat um, that leads you to Parliament's website, and there you can read the bill and you can also write a submission um, if you're moved by what you hear tonight. Um, so yeah, facts first. Uh, the name of the bill is Contraception, Sterilization and Abortion Safe Areas Amendment Bill. Quite a mouthful. Um, the Safe Areas Bill seeks to create 150 metre censorship zones or exclusion zones in the public spaces around abortion clinics on a case-by-case -case basis. This is Labour MP Louisa Wall's Members Bill. The first reading recently passed on the 10th of March with 100 MPs voting in favour and only 15 against. This bill is now before this Health Select Committee and they are currently accepting written submissions until the 28th of April, which is next Wednesday at midnight. Unfortunately, all the members of this committee voted for the bill in the first reading which is huge. Um, so last year in March, Labour's Extreme Abortion Legislation Act 2020 passed by a majority vote of 68 to 51. The result was one of the most extreme abortion laws in the world, which permits law lawful late-term abortions to be permitted up until and even during birth, as long as a medical practitioner, which doesn't need to be a doctor, reasonably believes that the abortion is clinically appropriate in the circumstances. A previous version of the Safe Areas Bill was actually included in the Abortion Legislation Bill, but during a late night mistake by Green MP Jan Logie and some others who had fallen asleep at the wheel, they missed a procedural call to oppose David Seymour's amendment to remove safe areas, and so it was successfully struck down. This result meant that currently people cannot be criminalised for simply maintaining a peaceful presence within 150 metres of an abortion facility. Procedural mistake or answer to prayer? Who knows? So it was one aspect of the new abortion law that the pro-abortion lobby really wanted and they didn't get. Hence why we are now faced with Louisa Wall's bill seeking to amend this now. Andrew Little, who was the Minister of Justice at the time, was the sponsor of the abortion legislation bill. He is now the, health, the Minister of Health. If the Safe Areas Bill passes, the Minister of Health will be the one making the decisions about which abortion facilities will have censorship zones enforced. So it's fair to say that these will not be unbiased calls. One of the arguments for originally wanting these censorship zones was the unfounded speculation that activity outside of abortion facilities would increase and be intrusive with the new abortion law coming into force. 13 months on, and this is simply not the case. There are many reasons why this legislation is problematic and why Christians should be deeply concerned by the precedent it will set if passed. But firstly, for context, Let's remember that an abortion is the deliberate killing of an unborn child. So straight away, the idea that abortion facilities where human lives are violently ended and mothers are harmed will be deemed safe areas, criminalizing pro-life advocates peacefully and prayerfully offering help and support is nothing short of using a euphemism. 
to twist reality. Unborn children in the safe area zones will certainly not be safe and neither will their vulnerable mothers. But not because of law abiding citizens on the footpath, but because of our very own taxpayer funded abortionists inside the abortion facilities. This bill will make Labour's Extreme Abortion Legislation Act even more extreme by making free speech and offering to help someone a criminal act in public spaces around New Zealand. It is poorly drafted and would significantly diminish our basic human rights. This is nothing short of targeted discrimination against the pro-life community, the majority of whom are Christians. This is truly a case of those who call evil good and good evil. On top of all of that, here are six more reasons to oppose this bill. So number one, the Attorney General, David Parker, has stated that this bill appears to be inconsistent with the right to freedom of expression as affirmed in section 14 of the Bill of Rights Act. It's a democratic and civil right that states everyone has the right to freedom of expression, including the freedom to seek, receive and impart information and opinions of any kind in any form. Number two, the New Zealand Law Commission and the majority of health professional bodies abortion service providers and health practitioners they consulted agreed that safe areas were unwarranted in New Zealand. So to quote them, the commission has not seen any clear evidence that the existing laws around intimidating and antisocial behavior are inadequate as would be required to justify the introduction of safe access zones. The commission does not suggest the introduction of safe access zones. Point three, the bill is not necessary in New Zealand. Existing laws already cover any problems that can arise outside abortion facilities. Currently, there is no evidence to suggest that women seeking abortion or abortion providers are targeted by threatening, abusive or insulting behaviours in New Zealand. And I'm sure we can all agree that these behaviours would be unacceptable and we wouldn't condone or participate in these actions. So thankfully, the Summary Offences Act 1981 is a legislation that exists to restrict protest activities that cause harm to others. New legislation should only include criminal offences if they are necessary to achieve a significant policy objective that cannot be achieved through other measures. Therefore, Louisa Wall's bill is redundant. The Summary Offences Act prohibits disorderly or offensive behaviour in a public space, intimidation, which includes stopping, confronting or accosting someone in a public space, and obstructing a public way. As a result, the safety and well-being of women and abortion providers are already pre protected from inappropriate protest actions. And so the proposed censorship zones which would restrict the rights of New Zealanders to freedom of expression are unnecessary, unjustified and unreasonable. What's really telling about the argument that women are being harassed is that when people using it are asked to provide concrete evidence to back up this claim, they struggle to do so and just end up citing things that current laws already outlaw in New Zealand. If there was any evidence that a case of intrusive protest was happening but wasn't included under the Summary Offences Act, then and only then would it be appropriate for a legislative response to be considered. But there isn't. <laughs> Reason number four, the bill will deprive women from receiving last minute care and support from sidewalk counsellors who can offer them alternatives to abortion. Many women have been helped and many babies' lives have been saved by the offer of support by sidewalk counsellors and pro-life advocates outside abortion facilities in New Zealand over the past 47 years. There are countless stories. Our outreach team knows of 38 babies saved from abortion, 38. There are just a couple of testimonies that I'd really love to quickly share with you. The first one is that one day while our team was outside the Hawke's Bay Hospital, so I live in Hawke's Bay, um, I live in Napier, um, a young woman and her sister-in-law approached our information table and showed a great interest in our small baby models. From her reaction, one of our team 
members, James, fortunately suspected that she was pregnant herself and carefully asked her if she was. She replied yes and said, but I have to get rid of mine. As doc apparently doctors had told her she should abort due to likely complications, including losing her own life if the pregnancy went ahead. In her own mind, she really wanted the baby, but thought she had to abort it. She was therefore waiting to hear back from the abortion clinic regarding her pre-abortion scan. Dawn and James from our team both started to asking, asking her a few questions and suggested to her that our group could pay for a consultation with a specialist obstetrician to gain a more qualified opinion. Gwen, a lovely retired nurse on our team, went with her to the appointment and the following week was with her when she received the news that she could continue with the pregnancy and would be carefully monitored throughout but the chances of severe complications were slim. Great outcome and one very relieved lady. Another time while at our pro-life information and pregnancy support stall outside of our local hospital, we were delighted when a young man approached us and shared a video of a beautiful, happy girl playing. He then shared that this was his daughter and how she had been scheduled to be aborted a couple of years ago. He said that when his partner drove to the hospital for the doctors to abort their daughter, she saw our pro-life signs and reconsidered, coming to the conclusion that she couldn't go through with it. We are thankful that that beautiful child we saw on the video made it to birth. Sadly, many others don't. The dad shared that all her family are so thankful as she is a joy to them and such a bright, happy little girl. If Louisa Wall's bill is passed, abortion vulnerable women will effectively be prevented from accessing offers of help in what could be a crucial time of need. It would further isolate vulnerable pregnant women and remove life affirming choices from their reach. Abortion then becomes the only choice, which is no choice at all. Censorship zones could also mean that a pregnant woman's discussions with her partner, friend or family member about abortion within a 150 metre radius of an abortion facility would become a crime. Do we really wanna live in a community where a simple offer of help to a woman who might want to keep her child is seen as a criminal offence? Should someone be punished for doing nothing but good? Should someone be criminalised for saving lives? Should helping women be a crime? Sadly, the truth, of abortion and its alternatives are often withheld from women both in the abortion system and in the public square. And the voices of women who receive this help and the voices of women who offer this help are being ignored. I'm sure we can all agree that women should not be harassed at any time, let alone when it comes to a life or death decision of abortion. Instead, pro-life advocates are available to provide free practical and emotional support and care to those who wish to engage with them. Over the last eight years, I've joined many of the groups who faithfully gather, standing peacefully and often prayerfully as a witness for life. And I can say from my personal experience that they are standing in love for both mother and child. Many have their own personal uh, story of abortion and why they feel compelled to be outside these places and provide alternatives to abortion. The nature of these vigils is passive, quiet and kind in the face of what can be dark and difficult situations. Women aren't being harassed, that's simply a lie. Politics at its worst. This bill singles out one group of people in society, namely members of the pro-life movement in an attempt to force them out of sight. The goal is to silence those who are a voice for the voiceless. The fact is that many people, some who'd be over 40 years old right now, are alive today in New Zealand because their mothers were able to receive the help they needed outside of an abortion clinic. Reason number five, the bill infringes on the right to freedom of peaceful assembly as listed in the democratic and civil rights in the Bill of Rights Act. So this could affect our public events, you know, the family friendly March for Life we hold each year in December and in regions across the year. Our unborn remembrance day outside every abortion clinic in New Zealand, remembering the lives lost in those places. Our 40 days for life, there'd be invisible boundaries all over our cities, covering our roads, our streets, our public parks. 
it'll be impossible to know what's lawful and what's not. Reason six, the bill infringes on our right to freedom, peaceful freedom of expression. Louisa Wills Wall's bill would unduly limit our fundamental rights and freedoms. The right to freedom of expression is not absolute, but must be held in balance against other rights such as privacy. But it's clear that this would this bill would be unbalanced and an unwarranted breach of New Zealanders civil liberties. The, the Governor General would be authorised to set up safe areas on recommendation of the Minister of Health, Andrew Little, who is pro-abortion, in consultation with the Minister of Justice, Chris Farfoy. Case by case, the ministers would decide the specific size and the exact location of the censorship zone. Andrew Little must first be satisfied that each prohibition is demonstrably justified in a free and democratic society as a reasonable limitation on people's rights and freedoms, end quote, <laughs> which is not a sufficient test for where to draw the line. It's deliberately broad, unclear and subjective and could result in this regulation making power being exercised unlawfully. Given the wide range of reasons for seeking abortion services, it would be difficult to formulate and apply a general legal test for what would cause emotional distress to an ordinary reasonable person who is seeking or providing abortion services. It also wouldn't be a requirement that actual emotional distress was even caused. The threshold would accordingly be set very low and in practice would create a total restriction on freedom of expression within the censorship zone. Under the Abortion Legislation Act, abortion can now be provided at unlicensed premises. And so a wide range of public space, spaces could be captured by the prohibitions around doctor's offices, pharmacies, and even schools. How would we even know where these 150 meter radius boundaries are? What happens if I'm unknowingly inside a censorship zone wearing a pro-life t-shirt or discussing the issue of abortion in earshot of others? You see, ultimately the aim of this bill is to silence pro-life voices and create fear when sharing our values in public. But they underestimate our commitment to this cause. We aren't going to stop being a voice for the voiceless and being there for women in dark and difficult times. Freedom of religion could also be attacked by the proposed legislation. Section 13 of the Bill of Rights, the freedom of thought, conscience and religion, and section 15, the manis manifestation of religion and belief. Some forms of prayer could be viewed as offensive or might be deemed to fall within the scope of prohibited behavior. Loudly expressed prayer could cause emotional distress to a protected person and could be viewed as offensive. We would be prevented from any prayer or behavior that expresses opposition, dissent or disagreement to abortion. Again, the line between what will be lawful and unlawful behavior will be really difficult to judge. In conclusion, safe areas are not a rational, reasonable or proportionate response to this object the objective. It is undemocratic to suggest that certain opinions can't be held and certain protests can't happen. It is uh, due to a lack of evidence and solid grounds, it would be an unjustified overreach to restrict New Zealanders' fundamental rights and freedoms. This proposed law will set a new legal precedent that is alarming for the Christian community. And so for those reasons, we need to oppose the introduction of censorship zones. And I will just stop there for now and let Gayanne take the lead. Hopefully I haven't gone over time.